In 2016, Minnesota providers wrote approximately 3.5 million prescriptions for opioids. Opioids are narcotic pain medications, frequently talked about Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycodone. Now, 3.5 million is a considerable number when you think about the fact that at that time in Minnesota, our population was only 5.5 million. At the same time, on a national level, opioids were killing more than 100 people per day. So this prompted the federal government to declare an opioid crisis as a national public health emergency in October of 2017. Now, as a general and trauma surgeon, I frequently perform invasive procedures, such as operations through open incisions to fix structural defects, remove cancer from patients' bodies. Now, these invasive procedures cause pain, and the pain is often treated with prescription opioids. There are two main classes of patients that we see. There are patients who are opioid naive, and those patients um, have minimal or no opioid use coming in. And there are patients who are opioid tolerant. Those are the patients who are already on chronic opioid medication at the time of surgery. So of opioid naive surgical patients, 6% of those patients go on to become new persistent users of opioids after surgery. And 23% of patients who are coming in for elective procedures are already taking chronic opioids. And these patients are still at risk for adverse events postoperatively due to continued opioid use. Now, it's really hard to know which patients will actually be affected. Take, for example, the successful anesthesia provider with the young family. She undergoes a simple bunion procedure and is prescribed opioids postoperatively to treat her pain. She goes on to form an opioid addiction, loses her job, and almost loses her life. So the big question is, as a surgeon, how can I play a role in improving the crisis? Well, I need to create less pain when I do the procedures that I do on a daily basis so that I'm able to prescribe less opioid pain medications. This will result in less risk of persistent use and less risk of adverse events related to the opioids that I prescribe. Advances in technology have resulted in minimally invasive surgical approaches, and this has allowed the progression from open surgery to robotic surgery. So the robot that I use in my practice is called the Da Vinci robot. The first case was performed on the Da Vinci in 1997. The Da Vinci went on to become FDA approved in 1998. And the first major adoption of the da Vinci robot was actually with urologists in removal of the prostate gland. Now, in my field of general surgery, we are the fastest growing market for the da Vinci robot. And approximately 877,000 procedures were done in 2017. This was up 16% from the year before. <coughs> In my practice, I typically use the robot for hernia and colon procedures. And in the United States, there were more than 1 million sur hernia surgeries performed on a yearly basis. And there are more than 600,000 surgical procedures that are done for colon disease in the United States. So this is a large potential population to impact. Now. There's a common misperception that the robot is actually the one doing the surgery. And this is not the case. <laughs> I spend a lot of time telling the patients about this. It is actually what we consider to be a master-slave system. And that means that the surgeon is telling the robot to do what to do. So the surgeon makes the incisions, inserts the equipment, and then is actually controlling the robot throughout the entire procedure. There are many patient advantages to robotic surgery. We're able to perform surgery through smaller incisions, thus creating a less invasive approach in our procedures. This results in less post-operative pain, and we're able to use less opioids on our patients after surgery. 
There's also a shorter length of stay for both inpatient and outpatient procedures. And we see less complications postoperatively, such as less blood loss, less postoperative infections. There are also advantages to the surgeon of robotic surgery. We're able to see things in 3D vision by the technology provided by the robot, and this gives us a visual that's more similar to what we're seeing when we do open surgery. We have equipment that provides us with better precision, and so we're able to do a finer dissection. The ergonomics are better because we're able to actually operate in a seated position. And we get better exposure to the field that we're working on. So what have I seen in my experience with the robot? Patients are having significantly less pain postoperatively and are able to use significantly less opioid medication. They have earlier return to their daily activities, such as driving. They're able to go back to work sooner. Our colon patients are going home in less than half the time that they normally would with an open procedure. And our hernia patients are using pain medications for days instead of weeks. Now, a great example of a big impact of this is patients undergoing a colon procedure for non-cancerous disease. We used to do an open surgery with an incision about this big. Patients would be in the hospital for five to seven days after surgery, and we would often have to write multiple refill prescriptions for opioid medications. These patients are now going home in two to three days with their largest incision being this big, and they're using minimal opioid medications after surgery, and their risks of the postoperative infections, hernias at their postoperative sites, are significantly lower. Now, there are some objections to robotic surgery. Certain procedures are more expensive when they're performed on the robot, and certain procedures take longer when they're performed on the robot. Robotic surgery does require the patient to be under a general anesthetic, and both the patients and the surgeons have to be willing to trust the technology. Now, greater education is needed to change perceptions of robotic surgery. Surgeons need to be willing to spread the word about possible robotic approaches for appropriate procedures. And patients need to be willing to advocate not only for themselves, but for others. In order to advocate for themselves, patients should feel free to do their own research on the procedures and to discuss with their surgeon, is the robotic approach appropriate for what I'm having done? Patients also need to advocate for others. Spread the word to family and friends. If you hear of somebody having a procedure done, tell them to ask their surgeon. See if it's a possibility. Now, there are some challenges to this. Not all patients are candidates for robotic surgery, and not all procedures are appropriate to do robotically. Not all surgeons are trained in robotic surgery and not all facilities have access to the robotic technology. However, willingness by both patients and surgeons to explore robotic surgery is one step to help decrease opioid use and improve outcomes in the fight against the opioid crisis. Educate yourselves, ask your surgeon, spread the word, and help us decrease the use of opioids in our community. Thank you.